coaches offense sputters, but defense shines in 30 to 7 win over San Jose State. Is the new NIL name image licensing rules a good idea? And how will it affect USC? Should Reggie Bush get his Heisman Trophy back? A preview of the Pac-12 conference opener against the Stanford Cardinal. Our panel predicts this week's Pac-12 games. We are SC! We are Hi, everybody. My name is Greg Katz, and welcome to Inside the Trojans Huddle. Inside the Trojans Huddle is a game-like panel discussion with We Are SC staff writers. Format is basically loosed on a collegiate football game. So without any further ado, let's meet the panel that you see in front of you. First of all, Chris Arledge. Chris is a We Are SC columnist who writes the highly popular column Musings with Arledge. Chris is a former all-conference defensive back and captain for the mighty William Jewell College Cardinals in Liberty, Missouri. Kevin Bruce, We Are SC columnist who writes the game review column defensively and this year, offensively speaking. A 1975 USC all-conference linebacker, and team captain, and a starter on the 1974 National Championship team of John McKay. And a new member, we welcome, uh, we, are as, we are SC staff member Mark Culkin, who has come from we, uh, USC Scoop. We welcome Mark. Mark will be writing columns uh, for We Are SC, uh, notes and observations, Monday morass, yay or nay, and practice reports. So we're pretty much set to go, but I'd like to introduce two new members to our to our panel that I'm sure you haven't met. I have uh, Mr. Bell. Uh, Mr. Bell, thank you for chiming in. Mr. Bell will alert us that if uh, we're getting to the point where we need about 30 seconds more, you can wrap up after you hear that bell. Now, in case Mr. Bell is ignored, we have Mr. Buzzer. Mr. Buzzer will only chime in occasionally. Hopefully we don't hear from Mr. Buzzer too often, but Mr. Buzzer signifies that you are done, you are completed, it's over. So with that in mind, let's get to the first topic. Uh, that's going to be your overall thoughts looking back at the San Jose State game. Let's welcome uh, Mark Culkin. Mark, we know that you are once known as the Trojan Warrior on the WeRSC message boards at one time. So uh, let us know, and I know you will, uh, your, your reflections on the San Jose State game. Uh, I think it was to be expected, a little disappointing. Um, I'm always the eternal optimist. So when you see the team come out the way they did, it's like, all right, so start first game, new offensive tackles. We'll see what happens going forward. Um, but it just kind of became the same menu that we've seen for the last couple of years. Um, so there, there was some good stuff. There was some not so good stuff. Uh, but I, I think, Going forward, uh, I'm going to continue to stay optimistic. That's the Very best way. Good. Very good. All right, uh, Chris, what was your take on the game? Well, I also like to stay optimistic, Greg, as you know. But um, I, I think I would like to pull out Mr. Buzzer on Graham Harrell, Clay Helton, and the USC offense because the simple fact the simple fact of the matter is the USC offense is a mess right now. Um, it uh, the, the running game is mediocre. It has been for years. Um, and the passing game, unless you're throwing fades to tall receivers downfield, is a lot of dink and dunk until you get in the red zone. Uh, and then you uh, and then you can't run the ball and there's no and there's no space for the receivers and you have to keep field goal. All right. So Mr. Buzzer needs to uh, needs to be used on those guys. There were some good things. Uh, good on the penalty and turnover front, which is which is nice, especially in the first game. The secondary is excellent. Um, San Jose State is a good test, but they're not a team full of NFL talent. And they don't really test USC where USC is weak, or I think they might be weak. Uh, they're not a great running team, for example. They were challenging the USC secondary, which is tough to do. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we'll, we'll see as we, get into, uh, as we get into the schedule. But, look, it was, uh, it's a win. It was a mediocre win against a mediocre team, but a win's better than a loss. We'll take it. Okay. El Capitan. Kevin, by the way, that background I was asked by my girlfriend, is that – who's number 84? I think I know who it is, but in behind you got McKay in number 84. Who is number 84? That's Bob Klein. Exactly. Okay. Your thoughts on the San Jose State uh, victory? Well, as we mentioned, look, a win's better than not a win, okay? That's not particularly insightful. The um... – <sighs> 
just keep checking the same boxes over and over and over again. I will tell you that the defense was improved from uh, prior seasons. So I like that. Um, fairly assignment sound, which was good to see for the most part. Um, the weaknesses on the defense are, frankly, I think pretty well known. Run the A-B gaps inside run game. Opens up a whole lot of downfield uh, activity. On offense, look, uh, none of us should, should uh, pretend we, don't, we haven't seen this act before. We have. Uh, some different players. There's a lot of skill out there. And to perform that poorly in the red zone is not new, but it's disappointing nonetheless. I have to think that you know somebody's going to have to try to figure out how to score in the red zone. But if you can't run the football successfully, you're going to struggle scoring touchdowns in the red zone. Um, and, and we saw that. We saw some good play uh, from some, some great athletes. That's a good thing. I think we saw some – this is not a shortage of talent. This is a, a shortage of uh, scheme and um, I guess to some extent execution. As Chris pointed out, look, seam routes or excuse me, fade routes, fine. Seam routes, fine. We, we cannot throw a passing crossing pattern for the life of us when we see a cover eight uh, defense. It's crazy. And until we start to figure this thing out and then start to run uh, the ball effectively, we are going to struggle and struggle and struggle. And you can't count a defense putting up a seven point uh, near blanking uh, every week. Uh, I was uh, very disappointed with special team play, I have to tell you, for the most part. Uh, Field goal kick, fine, good, uh, very accurate, short but accurate, but that's our red zone, right? That's our red zone touchdown offense is kicking field goals. Uh, and uh, good to say we're three for three. We had one 20-yard uh, uh, touchdown uh, catch, which was considered a red zone conversion. I think that's cheating. It's like a 20-yard is not really red zone conversion. Come on. What are we going to do on, you know, third and five uh, and goal? I mean, you know, there we go. Um we kicked out, uh, kick off out of bounds. That's cardinal rule. You never do that. Little joke there on the cardinal, by the way. Um, we had a holding on a a punt. Why, why on punt coverage? What what are you thinking when people do that? Uh, and then we had a running into the kicker. Um, those are the kinds of things easy to correct. But I was just frankly very surprised that uh, Coach Snyder let those kinds of things happen on his team. Was ready to play. Okay, well, I'll make mine uh, rather brief. I, I feel like I've seen this for the last four or five years. It's like putting on the same reel. Uh, it's not necessarily whether they win the game. Of course, you know, they were winning the game. But it's like I'm watching the same production the same way, uh, the same no scoring in the third quarter. It's the same old, same old. And uh, I was very disappointed, and uh, I probably will get some disagreement here at at the end of the game, uh, if you're really trying to get ready for uh, game situations, to be throwing the ball deep uh, near the very end of the game to try to get cosmetic points really annoyed me. And the reason it did was I know why they were doing it. I don't buy into the fact that they were working on their situation mastery on it. Uh, I saw it as trying to make a statement to the country, but the country saw it. The country saw that uh, up until uh, this point, they had only scored one touchdown. So I was disappointed in that. I wouldn't have done it if I was coaching personally. Uh, you know what? Just get the win. Get out of there. Go watch the tape and figure out what happened for 85% uh, of the game. Uh, good point, I thought, was there wasn't a lot of penalties. They really cut down their penalties from a year before, and they're to be complimented on that. I don't think the tackles were all that bad. I am a little concerned about the inside, the guards and the center. Uh, but that being said, a win is a win, and we'll take it at face value, and let's just move on. All right, hey, let's go to the hey, second Greg, quarter. if it makes you feel any better, if it What's makes that? you feel any better, the country didn't see it because it was on the Pac-12 network. There were only about <laughs> 600 people that saw it, the you, four you know, of us and some others. <laughs> you know, Mr. Venom always does take a negative and turn it into a positive. And I can speak for the country. That was well said. That was well said. Um, all right, let's move to the second quarter, guys. Uh, 
What do you think about this new NIL rule, name, image, licensing rules? How will that affect USC and recruiting and, uh, and other uh, facets? Of, is it a good idea? Uh, let's, let's start off with uh, El Capitan. Kevin, what do you think? Well, uh, my thoughts are it's legal. That's about it. It just creates all kinds of issues. But, you know, the players have been um, for, you know, decades uh, putting up a lot of, uh, uh, you know, physical injuries, uh, head trauma, other elements Then the NC2A and the universities have been capitalizing on that to the tune of billions of dollars of enterprise value. So if the players can get something out of the deal, God bless them. Go for it. I happen to have a point of view that I think, uh, frankly, some of the uh, women's sports will do, have uh, more successful NIL dollars than uh, the men's sports. Okay. Uh, what, what say you, Mark? Uh, on, on Kevin's last point, I, I thoroughly agree. Uh, I, I think some, certain women's and Olympic sports will probably do a lot better just because of the overseas advertising dollars. Um, as far as USC football is concerned, too soon to tell. My, I do have a concern that, you know, you are going to have, you know, the elite, you're going to have the bottom players. There's not going to be a whole lot of in the middle stuff. And what type of, you know, how do the personalities handle that? Um, you know, there, there's going to be occasions where you're going to have certain players who are actually making more money off the field than low level assistants and GAs. So, you know, again, this, this is more about does the right personality fit and how much of that responsibility, you know, falls on, you know, the coaching staff because they're in charge of the culture in that locker room. So, you know, I don't care how much money these guys make um, as long as, you know, <laughs> I don't want to say doing it illegally, but um, it's above board and they don't let it get out of control. I'm fine with it, to be honest with you. Well, I think, too, you now, points. You yeah, I think it's just too soon to tell how, how it's going to play out, though. Okay, Chris, what do you think? It, it, look, this had to be done. The, the reality is that college football was not an amateur sport for a very long time. It's, a, it's an industry. It, it may be the second most popular pro sport in the country. It generates billions of dollars. And all of that was being split up by universities, coaches, and, and the television. Uh, networks, uh, none of it going to the guys who are actually risking their health and putting in the time. That's outrageous. So yes, it, th it makes things more complicated. Uh, it is going to introduce some issues in the, the locker room. Of course, pro sports have had that forever, right? Tom Brady makes a lot more money than the backup tight end. You'll figure it out. But the idea that college football could make this kind of money and and pretend that it's an amateur sport so the, the players can't benefit from their name, image, and likeness was outrageous. So it, it had to be, it had to change, and the courts are the courts are going to force it to change, obviously, anyway. Um, will it help USC? Uh, I, look, the major programs always have a huge advantage when it comes to recruiting. This is one more reason why USC will have an advantage over Oregon State. But if USC really wants to capitalize on this advantage, it has to be serious about football. And, and it's not. And so, um, and so it will still continue to fall behind the other major powers who still do care about football until we fix that. All good points. All good points. My, my personal opinion is it has to be refined. It has to be refined. I thought JT Daniels did a really good thing in Georgia when he uh, signed his uh, NIL. He said he wanted to donate some of the money he would make to the rest of the team. And I think that, that he's on to something there. Because let's face it, uh, how many offensive linemen do you know are going to be signing uh, autographs? You know, it's a it's a it's a recipe for success. It's a recipe for a disaster in the locker room if not thought out. And what should we do? I could see, uh, you know, let's let's take a look at just uh, uh, Bryce Young at, at Alabama. Even before he was named quarterback, he had signed, according to Nick Saban, close to a million dollars in endorsements. Before he'd even been named quarterback, what does that send to the rest of the team? I thought Saban handled it wonderfully, uh, but the bottom line is, it's a rule. It's a new thing. It's got some really good points. It's got some points they really have to adjust. And let's just hope that uh, in the end, you don't want somebody going into a living room recruiting, going, "Well, if, if you think Alabama can get you a million, I'll tell you what, we can get you two million." 
And all of a sudden, that's going to be the bidding war. That's going to be the real, to me, uh, crucible for recruiting on how recruiting is, uh, should we say, conflicted uh, and competition within the NIHL. So, okay, that's good. All right, we're at halftime. Now for what I think is an explosive halftime question, and that's why I'm going to start off with Mr. Uh, well, I don't want to call him Mr. Warren. We'll just call him Chris. Uh, Chris, what do you think? Should Reggie Bush get his Heisman Trophy back? Yeah, of course he should. Uh, unless we're going to strip the Heisman away from everybody else who got benefits while they were in college they shouldn't have gotten, which would probably leave about two Heisman winners, both from Army or Navy back in the 50s. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Um, I, look, I have issues with how Reggie handled his business, particularly with um, uh, with not just paying off that uh, that crook that his family got involved with so we could avoid all this. But it doesn't change the fact that Reggie Bush earned that Heisman on the field, and he's at least as deserving as most of the other guys that still have theirs. All right, Mark? Yeah, uh... You're not going to get a whole lot of argument from me. It should never, first of all, he should have never given it back. The Heisman, you know, trust never asked for it back. Reggie volunteered it back. Um, on Saturday, I was watching, what is it, that, the Fox Noon big kickoff show, whatever they, they call it. And Herschel Walker, uh, you know, was commenting on it. He basically said, hey, he's ready to fight for it. You know, Matt Leinert stepped in. So there's already a new, you know, push for Bush campaign, so to speak, going on. Um, and I think eventually it's there, someone's going to relent and it's, Reggie Bush is going to be holding it again. USC can go pull theirs out of the basement, dust it off, put it back up there and hair it all. Everyone will be happy. Hopefully by the end of the year. All right, Captain, what do you think? Yeah, I have no interest in the rehabilitation of Reggie Bush. I don't care. Till he apologizes for what he uh, purposely uh, transacted <clears throat> it caused the university as much hurt as it's is caused uh, i don't have i don't have room for him in my uh, pantheon of uh, usc heroes sorry if it helps our recruiting yeah that's great um, i don't care what's uh trophies in his living room could care less what i do want to see is the heisman trophy back up in heritage hall well i'm sorry that both mark and chris are wrong dead wrong as far as their their viewpoint and I'm going to now barbecue both of you uh, because this, this topic really uh, freaking annoys me. And I'll tell you why. Yes, Reggie Bush was the best college football player in America his final year. Yes, he's one of the all-time great running backs ever in college football. I buy into that. Reggie Bush should never have been on the field. And I'll tell you why, and I've written about this. First of all, Imagine being on the other team, knowing a guy that was basically ineligible uh, beating you. How was Fresno State feeling? The players going, that, that so-and-so, he was cheating. Now, I agree with Chris totally. This has been going on since the beginning of time. No argument there. I get where Mark's coming from. But I look at it from a coaching standpoint. If this was the CIF Southern section in high school – and a player was ruled ineligible, the team would forfeit games. Now, I'm all for winning. I don't think he should get his Heisman Trophy back because he cheated. He got caught cheating. This whole idea, this whole idea of uh, Reggie uh, campaigning his own documentary, Reggie uh, on Fox Sports, uh, Herschel, who is Herschel Walker, for goodness sakes? He's a nobody. You know, he's a nobody. You know, I actually met Herschel Walker. I he, played, he played once, I think, Greg. I think he played once. <laughs> he might have tripped he over a football in this day. Actually, he he's, he's a pretty good guy, and he's a pretty darn good football player. <laughs> well, I tell you, we, we, that's another. I look back a little bit, Greg. <laughs> that's, that's another we, whole different discussion. I just say this. He was ineligible from my point of view, and he should have never been on the field. And it, I think it was – I feel bad for the teams that, that lost to him. As great as he was, and I make no exception, he should not. Let me tell you something. Shouldn't you get all the fines that you had for speeding 20 years ago because they changed the limit and, and you're an innocent victim? I don't think that Reggie Bush is an innocent victim, and I'll leave it at that. Where's Mr. Right. Buzzer? Where's Mr. Buzzer? 
<laughs> hey, I, by the I, way, I, I, I would just point out in 1975, Kevin Bruce was driving around in a Rolls Royce and flying in a private jet. I don't know how it happened, but that's what I hear. Okay. Wow. I have a rich family. That's how it happened. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's move on to the third quarter, guys. Did you find any surprises with the Pac 12 in general for the games that you watched? What did you think was great? What did you think was like embarrassing? Just overall in general. Uh, all right, Animal, go ahead. You start off first. Well, clearly the, uh, the two bookends of that question are uh, is um, U- uh, UCLA <coughs> just steamrolled um, LSU. And I wasn't hugely surprised that they were competitive. I was surprised that they were dominating. Um, that's a real football team, at least for right now. Uh, there's still time for them to do their usual implosions, but um, that's a good football team on the field. Um, on the flip side, Washington's <laughs> implosion with respect to Montana, the Grizz, uh, was something to behold, I have to tell you. I mean, my gracious. So um, those were the two uh, uh, bookend surprises I had, both on the plus side and on the uh, negative side. All right, uh, moving right along. Okay, Mark, what did you think? Well, you guys probably had a little bit more of an advantage watching these games on TV. Um, I was kind of busy during some of these games. However, uh, just looking at the scores, uh, yeah, it sucked. Um, I, I'm not a huge Pac-12 rah-rah guy. I mean, it's always been, you know, USC and everybody else as far as I'm concerned. Um, however, you know, the Pac-12 just, you know, Hand shook their agreement with the Alliance and, you know, George Klivkoff is stepping in trying to improve the image and man, talk about the kickstand coming down and tripping over it, so to speak. Uh, the Pac-12 did a great job of uh, showing who they are. So you had USC winning, um, sort of looking good. You had Oregon escaping at home against Fresno State. You, you had, as Kevin just mentioned, Washington. I don't know what happened there, but they scored a touchdown at home and lost to Montana. Uh, Oregon State, I guess, represented well on the road in West Lafayette, even though they came up short. Um, Arizona lost at home to BYU. UCLA, and I did see parts of that game when I got home. Uh, yeah, you know, but this is what you get from UCLA during the year. Their, their players aren't in class yet, so they're literally just focused on football. And this was their their game to key on. Yeah, I'm not sure UCLA's uh, football it, it deteriorates yeah. when classes start because that's where these guys are spending their time. <laughs> yeah, I don't, uh, think, LS, I don't right. think LSU was overly focused on classes either, Mark, for what it's worth. Right. No, 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 I agree with you. And, and I'm getting to my, my point here. Uh, thank you, Greg and Mr. Bell. Um you know, UCLA has a very experienced team. Chip Kelly was able to motivate these guys. Ed Orgeron's got hot garbage going over there in, in Baton Rouge. So was it an impressive win? If you're looking at LSU being 16th ranked, sure. Uh, we'll see who UCLA is as, as the season goes on. I don't think LSU's all that. And we know Hawaii wasn't all that. So overall, the Pac-12 looked like crap. All right, uh, Chris, do you want to uh, in- embolden the crap? Um, I-, I don't know that I ever want to do that. But uh, by the way, I apologize for bleeding. I just had some stitches in my lips. I think blood may be coming down my face. So this turned into like a horror film. Um, but that's appropriate in light of our topic. Look, the Pac-12 is dreadful. Uh, UCLA is better. They look like what I thought UCLA would look like when Chip got hired. It only took us how many years to get there. The rest of the conference is awful. Stanford had less than 160 yards and no points going into that last touchdown drive of theirs. Washington had under 300 yards and seven points against an FCS team. Uh, You had a whole series of losses from the conference. USC had a single touchdown going into the fourth quarter on a short field against San Jose State, which isn't exactly loaded with NFL prospects on defense. The Pac-12 is a it is a clown show right now and um and usc wins this conference once every five years so um do with that what you will 
Washington should climb under a rock and stay there until September of 2022. Uh, they, they may turn out to be a decent football team this year. I doubt it. But after that performance, they shouldn't. They shouldn't be. They should be banned from television. Uh, we shouldn't have to to talk about them or look at them anymore this year. Yeah, that's number two behind Michigan and Appalachian State. Yeah, at least App State was a really good Division One AA team. I'm not sure Montana's even that. Yeah, fair point. So the yeah. chances of Oregon and, and Washington going on the road next week and winning are between slim and none. Well, you're going to make your predictions here in a minute. All right. Well, I'm going to take take my chances here and say that I was totally uh, embarrassed uh, for the conference. It only hammered a dead body. Uh, I thought it was atrocious. I thought UCLA uh, had a great win. I'm not so sure LSU is any good because they've had issues. And I don't buy into the fact that I don't care that they didn't start school. Hey, look, at their, their football players. They come to play LSU. Of course, they had to go to Houston, and uh, that was maybe disruptive. But, you know, when it was all said and done, they're playing on national TV. They're playing. And I, so I don't know if UCLA is as good as they showed, and I certainly don't think that LSU was as good as their rep. So, again, I, I think UCLA is really good. I think until they prove that they're not, uh, I'm going to go with the idea that they are pretty good. And I, down the road, I'll tell you what, uh, you, you look at the transfers that UCLA has gotten, they are really good. They know what they're doing. They have a philosophy, and they're doing it. And by the time they play the Trojans, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with, in my opinion. Uh, in terms of the guy I feel bad for is uh, the new commissioner of the Pac-12. He's got some, or he's got some real work, uh, and he shouldn't be blamed for uh, what's going on. This has to do with the schools, their, their, the, the selection of their coaches, the coaches and their recruiting, the coaches and their philosophy. This is a deeper problem than just the Pac-12 stinks. Uh, you know, I, I guess the way I, my hope in the future is, is that uh, coaching-wise they can get the right guys uh, because right now they're really going downhill, and it's a joke. I, I, I hate to say it, but uh, look, when you're on par with the Mountain West Conference and, you're, and they're competing with you, that, to me, is a tremendous warning sign. So, all right, we're going to go now into uh, Stanford, fourth and final uh, quarter. Uh, you know, I wanted to find a candle so I could lit a, uh, light a symbolic uh, Coliseum torch, and I just don't have it this week, so I apologize for that. I was going to take a birthday candle and, and light it. Maybe uh, I'll do that next week since I've advanced myself with buzzers and bells. But let's turn our attention to next Saturday night in terms of Stanford. Uh, obviously, coming off a horrendous performance, I watched the game. It was embarrassing. Uh, I, knew, I actually predicted that Kansas State would beat Stanford. I don't know if that makes me Mr. Uh, you know, Mr. Mentor, but I, I couldn't stand watching it. I thought it was uh, bad. But forget about what I think right now. Let's, I want to find out what you guys think. So, uh, Kevin, what do you think? What do you think about Saturday night's game against the Cardinal? Well, we'll make a game out of any team. Um, and even Stanford coming in, you know, limping and, and uh, you know, having shown that they really have some issues uh, at, uh, at quarterback, um, they're going to put up a, a better effort than what they showed um, this past Saturday. That's, that's a pretty easy call on my part. Um, Conversely, I don't suspect our offense is going to be all that much different or better. So, um, you know, I see a win. I see another San Jose State type win uh, in this uh, in this situation, and uh, hopefully the uh, special teams will get uh, things tidied up there so we can start to flip the field versus the other way around. That'll help us against Stanford. They're a possession team. They only ran 52 plays. They had the ball for 33 minutes, and they put up exactly seven points, and they're lucky to do that. So, look, they're, uh, they are uh, susceptible to, uh, to a good defensive showing, pressures his quarterback, and clearly uh, you know, he, he's having some difficulty. They may actually go to a, another starting quarterback, frankly, in my view. Um, they didn't run the football worth a hoot. And defensively, I think they'll put up a much better effort because, frankly, Against us, um, we're a very predictable offense. Makes it a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, skill upon skill. And 
So I like our chances. Um, I don't see us putting up a lot of points. Okay, let's uh, – Chris, what's your take, buddy? Yeah, look, Stanford isn't very good, and they haven't been very good for a few years now. Um, but they're going to they're gonna slow down the game. They'll hold you to four possessions per half. If USC has four possessions, they're going to have two punts and two field goal attempts. Right? That's, what, that, that's, what, that's what the USC offense is capable of these days. Um, I don't think Stanford's going to be foolish enough to, uh, to play man-to-man on Drake London and let him uh, beat them downfield. I think they're going to drop a bunch of guys back in coverage. USC will throw a bunch of short passes to stationary guys, and Stanford's going to wait to see if they can get a holding penalty or a dropped ball uh, or just see whether, uh, whether USC will stall in the red zone. And I think USC wins the game. I think it's ugly. I think it's disappointing, but we'll get a win. And um, – if that doesn't make you excited to watch Saturday, then I don't. I don't know what I can tell you, Greg. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I want to go to the Trojan Warrior here. Uh, tell me, Mark, uh, and, and try to be honest and, and, and don't hold back. Now, what do you see? So, you know, I, I'm listening to you guys talk, and I, I don't disagree with anything they're saying. Um, for me, if as long as USC continues to try and improve on whatever they're doing on offense, they're going to win the game. With Stanford, I, you know, Chris touched on it. Um, these guys are, are kind of void of talent, and it keeps getting worse year by year. They're, they can't find a quarterback at Stanford. Um, the skilled players, you know, who are they? Um, you can't even name, you know, a good tight end right now. So um, they don't scare me on offense. You know, are they going to do enough defensively to stop USC? A few times, yeah. Thomas Booker is there on the defensive end. He'll, you know, create some havoc. Um, but I just don't know if they have enough on the back end to deal with the passing game, even when they get to the red zone. We'll see. Uh, I, I Again, I saw what happened in the first quarter against Kansas State. Uh, they looked strong uh, initially, you know, great interception by number 17. But then... Uh, that same guy was getting trucked by the quarterback who ran in for a touchdown on the next possession. So uh, I agree. I don't think Stanford's going to really pose a whole lot of challenges, uh, at least for USC's defense. Um, it's a matter of can USC just take the next step on offense and, 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 and look like they're developing because I, I just, again, I'm repeating myself. I don't think Stanford has anything on offense to worry about right now. All right. Well, uh, I think that I will chime in myself. Um, I saw Stanford. I thought they were horrible. Uh, they don't have the running backs that they used to have. They're not dominating the line of scrimmage like they, they have normally done. It's a disgrace that Stanford doesn't have a great quarterback. Uh, you know, quarterbacks basically fall into their lap and they've done a great job with them in the past. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I think David Shaw is still a good coach. He knows his system. He knows what he wants to do. But I think the key to the game is which team can put – and I know this is going to sound really stupid, uh, but then consider the source. Um, it's really the team that can score the most points. And because Stanford showed no threat of uh, going into deep double digits in points, and because SC only scored, in my mind, one touchdown, I'm sorry, we're not going to argue that – uh, that second touchdown they scored at the end of the game was meaningful at all. They were relying on field goals. I do like SC's defense against the Stanford offense. The question I don't know is, I think SC was holding back more offensively uh, against San Jose State than, than Stanford was holding back against Kansas State. And, and in, that, in that sense, uh, it could be a relatively close game. And I don't discount the fact that Stanford couldn't beat them uh, I know one thing, whoever loses this game may say more about them than it says about who the, who the winner is. So uh, it's an interesting game. I want to find out just how good or bad that Stanford offensive line is compared to the Trojans defensive line, uh, because we know what Shaw's philosophy is. And this will be a good test for the Trojans, whose defensive line, I might say, uh, showed some really some good things along the way. But they're, they're going to be tested. They're going to be tested. Have we pretty much exhausted that? Everyone ready to move on to predictions? We're all good? All right. Chris, I did give you a shot at it, didn't I, or no? Yeah, 
Yeah, I, it must have been a memorable answer, Greg. <laughs> Pardon me while I yawn. Uh, all right, let's get to the predictions, guys. We're in overtime. This is when we can have a little bit of fun about it. Uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, for the sake of time, uh, I'll give a brief intro to the to the game we're going to uh, predict. Just give me the score. You want to give a brief line of why you think you are. Let's not belabor the scores. We'll start off with the biggie, of course. Ohio State's 14-point favorite uh, hosting Oregon on Saturday. Game is at 9 a.m. Uh, Oregon time. Uh, I'm going to start off. I believe that Ohio State will take it to them 38-20. to 20. Okay, Chris, you're on. 51-21 Buckeyes, and I hope it's really, really ugly. <laughs> Would you like to add another really in that, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, maybe a third. I, I, if Oregon gets humiliated on national television, that will make my weekend. All right, Mark, what do you think? 45-24, hang on, Sloopy. All right. Oh, you, very good. You know your Ohio State knowledge. Very good. Kevin, go ahead. Ohio State wins. 47-25. Wow. Well, this will be another embarrassing uh, Saturday for the Pac-12 if Oregon is indeed the best team supposedly in the Pac-12. All right, let's move on. Uh, TCU is hosting Cal. TCU is a 10-point favorite. I'm going to pick TCU 30-17. to Chris? TCU will win. I doubt if Cal will score more than 10 points. Okay, Mark? Yeah, what was that final score between Nevada and Cal? <laughs> yeah, TCU 30, Cal 10. Okay. El Capitan? Yeah, 41, um, 13. TCU. Okay. Very good, very good. All right, Texas A&M travels to Boulder to play at Colorado. A&M is a 17-point favorite. I'm picking uh, Texas A&M 38-17. Chris? Yeah, that, that sounds about right. A&M may score more than that, 45 to 20, 45 to 14, something like that. It'll be a bloodbath. Well, here's an interesting one. Go ahead. Uh, anybody? Do we get everybody there? I'm just checking my notes here. Uh, Portland State goes to Pullman, Washington to play Washington State, the Trojans' next opponent. Interestingly enough, there has been no uh, odds laid on this. Uh, it is off the board. I don't know what that means. Maybe the game is so horrible that they don't even want to pick a game, a winner on it. But I'm going to pick uh, the Cougars uh, 31 to 20 over mighty Portland State. Chris? I'm going to follow Vegas' example. I'm not even going to talk about this game. It's that bad. <laughs> it's that bad, Greg. Mark? Yeah, I, I don't think the I don't think Wazoo will cook it. Um, Forty to thirteen. All right, Kev. Yeah, who cares? <laughs> well, that's quite but, a uh, literal, literally. Who cares? Why, why would you schedule Portland State I'm for crying out loud? Well, let's look at it in a better point. Why would the Pac-12 Network even schedule it? That that tells me how bad it should be. Yeah, they, have right. a con they have a contract. That's why. <laughs> that's why. All right. Those mighty Huskies of Washington uh, are traveling to Michigan. Michigan is the six point favorite. Uh, I don't know. I thought Washington was an embarrassment last week and Michigan playing in the big house can be, can be intimidating uh, if they get off to a fast start, but I'll pick the Wolverines 24, 17, but I don't think it's going to be that close. That's my opinion. Chris. Yeah, th th this is not a replay of the Don James, Bo Schimbeckler, Rose Bowl. Um, Michigan wins easy, probably 38 to 10. Washington is a horrible football team. They'll try harder for a quarter and then they'll collapse. Mark? Yeah, I'm going to follow Chris's lead on this. I saw absolutely zero seconds of this game. I saw the score. So, um, yeah, I'm going to take Michigan at home. All right, Kevin, what do you think? Yeah, Michigan, uh, let's give them maybe 41. And, um, you know, we should get some points. So uh, how about 13 by Washington? Okay. All right, let's move along. The Aztecs of San Diego State are going to Tucson to play to Arizona. Uh, Arizona is a one-point favorite. I'll, I'm going to go with the sentimental pick, Arizona. I think uh, Fish could get uh, his first victory I say 27 24. Uh, Mr. Arledge? 28 24, San Diego State. Pac 12 drops another one. 
Mark? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Arizona 30-27. They were close against BYU at home or in Vegas. I think they'll pull this one out at home. Animal? Yeah, I'll, uh, I can't say I like Arizona, but I think they'll win. So, um, you know, how about 28-23? Uh, okay. Now, here's a game that I think has a lot of intrigue to me. Uh, Utah is going to Provo to play at BYU. Uh, Utah is a seven-point favorite. I'm going to pick uh, the uh, Utes, and I still don't understand why we have to have that as a nickname, but the Utes as it is, uh, 27 to 20 uh, over BYU. Chris? I'm going to go 21-13 Utah. BYU is replacing their quarterback. It's a rivalry game. The game's at BYU, which means it wouldn't shock me if BYU won. But I think uh, I think Utah pulls this one out. Mr. Culkin? Yeah, I'm going to go 35-30 Utah just because. Just because. Well, that's that's very specific. Just because and BYU struggled with Arizona. I thought you were Johnny Mathis just because. Just All right, because. Kevin, what do, you, what do you got? Yeah, I, uh, I got, uh, let's say, 38-17. Uh, All right, here's an unintriguing game to me. UNLV uh, going to uh, – Happy to play Arizona State. ASU is 32-point favorite. Uh, I think it'll be a, a route. Uh, I'll go 44-20 uh, with the Sun Devils, and I don't have any more to say about that one. Chris? Yeah, ASU wins by six touchdowns, and they get six more recruiting violations. <laughs> only? <laughs> well, well, just Saturday. It's only Saturday. That's not even a, it's not even a work day for the NCAA. <laughs> All right, Mr. Culkin. Yeah, ASU big, 50 to 13. Okay, Kevin? Yeah, Arizona State, 48, um, 13. Okay. Uh, let's go to um, Oregon State is hosting the uh, Warriors of Hawaii. Uh, I like Oregon State's program. Oregon State is favored by 11. I'm going to take the Beavers, uh, 38 to 20. Chris? Yeah, I'm going to pick the Beavers. Look, if Oregon State can't beat that Hawaii team at home, they're really in trouble because that Hawaii team is horrible. I'm going to go 31-20 Oregon State. Mark? Yeah, that's a good score. I think Oregon State yeah, Oregon State's going to win this game. Johnson Smith has got that team trending in the right direction for what he can do with up there. Totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, Kevin? Yeah, Oregon State, uh, 28, Hawaii, uh, 9. Okay. Well, that brings us to the most, probably the national game of the week, I would suspect, Stanford at USC. Uh, uh, SC, I don't know, I've seen two uh, two sports lines on it, opened up at 14, it's at 17 and a half now. Uh, I'm going to take uh, the minute Troy. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be low score wins, but I'm going to go with uh, 31-20 because I'm not sure of the uh, of the uh, Graham Harrell factor. So I'm going to say it's a 31-20 win for the Trojans. Chris? Did you say USC is favored by 17 and a half? I just checked it, sir. They're, they're not even going to score 17 points. Well, that's uh, that's an outrageously foolish. Okay, um, I don't know where that came from. USC wins this game 24-19. It's ugly. We'll take it. All right. Markster. Yeah, um, I'm putting my helmet on. So I'm going USC. Not only is USC going to cover the spread, they're going to do it two weeks in a row and annihilate the spread. Cosmetic or not, Greg? 41-17. All right. That's like a man of conviction. Very well done. It's got nothing on offense this year. <laughs> well, we're going to find out. All right. Kevin. Yeah, I can make that claim both ways. Um, 33-17. Trojans. 33-17. So we're saying that basically after this week, the Trojans will be 2-0. and All right, guys. First of all, a reminder that the Pac-12 Conference opener is this uh, Saturday night, 7.30, against the Stanford Cardinal. And a reminder, it's, it is a 7.30 kickoff, and it'll be shown on Fox Television. Uh, 
Tim Brando, by the way, is calling the play-by-play. I didn't even know he was still doing the play-by-play, but uh, that's what uh, the release said. And a reminder, next Tuesday we'll review the Stanford game, preview the big first road game of the season to Washington State, uh, as well as selected topics uh, relating to Trojans and college football in general. And I, I really will want to hear from Kevin, by the way, on what it's like as a player's perspective to travel to Pullman, Washington. So until next Tuesday, I'd like to thank our three panelists. Uh, thank all of you for watching and uh, fight on everybody. Fight on.